Dear viewers, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are joining us from, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Overcrowded and under-monitored, helping improve patient safety in emergency departments, which will be delivered in just a moment by Dr. Robert Bilkowski and Dr. Kyle Gunnarsson. My name is Karim Pisha, and I am a clinical marketing leader at G Healthcare. I will be facilitating today's webinar. It's no secret that emergency departments are overcrowded and face operational and patient safety challenges amid workflow shortages and increasingly complex patients. Continuous vital signs monitoring drives earlier detection of deterioration, particularly for those patients waiting in triage or boarding for extended periods of time and whose decline may be missed by spot checks. When layered on top of spot checking, wireless wearable monitoring for patients can provide a true safety effect that lowers emissions, cognitive burden, and help drive better outcomes for the rest of the patient. Uh, this webinar will describe both the current pain points and the new opportunities for vital signs monitoring in emergency departments and how newer technologies could advance patient care and hospital economics. Please note this webinar recording is the exclusive property of GA Healthcare. No part of, of the following content may be copied or reproduced without prior written permission from GA Healthcare. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets, which you can use. I'll briefly cover the most important ones. We would like to draw your attention to the resources widget, where you can click and bookmark the links at any time for future reference. Also, during the webcast, you can submit questions through the Q&A widget. We will try and answer as many as possible at the end of, the, of today's presentation. You can find answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen too. Finally, for the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any program running in the background. This webinar's recording will be posted on GE Healthcare Clinical View platform. Clinical View is a free resource for medical professionals intended to provide educational material and clinical information as well as share best practices. Please do not hesitate to browse and bookmark this page to watch past webinars on demand and check for future live webinars. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our webcast presentation, Overcrowded and Under Monitored, Helping Improve Patient Safety in Emergency Departments, presented by Dr. Robert Bilkowski and Dr. Kyle Dunerson. Dr. Bilkowski has a broad management experience, having served in leadership roles in multiple Fortune 500 companies, overseeing medical affairs and clinical development in IVD, medical device and pharmaceuticals industries. Some of the companies where he served uh, in leadership roles include Hospira, DE Healthcare, Abbott, and Beckton Dickinson. Robert currently is the president of RB Ventures Consulting, providing strategic consulting in the field of medical and clinical affairs for medical device and diagnostic companies. Dr. Bilkowski received his undergraduate degree in biochemistry with a focus in genetic engineering at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Robert completed his medical training at Rosalind Franklin University, the Chicago Medical School, and subsequently pursued specialization in emergency medicine. Lastly, Dr. Bilkowski earned his MBA at the University of Notre Dame as part of his transition from clinical medicine to medical industry. Dr. Gunnarsson has been clinically active in both cardiovascular ICU and emergency department for more than 20 years. Dr. Gunnarsson's research includes several large collaborative projects funded by both industry and governmental funding agencies. These have ranged from the discovery and development of novel biomarkers in critical illness to the treatment of severe sepsis and septic shock. He also has been active in the development of non-invasive technology used for the identification of and treatment of patients with critical illness and injury as, and, and was a co-investigator of the first ED-based ECMO clinical trial for refractory cardiac arrest. Dr. Gunnarsson was the inaugural chief of the Division of Critical Care in the University of Michigan Department of Emergency Medicine and the founder of the Emergency Critical Care Center, the first ICU within an emergency department in the US. With extensive experience managing complex cardiac surgery patients and extracorporeal support, he has been instrumental in advancing emergency critical care as a specialty and currently serves on the board of directors of the Society of Critical Care Medicine. 
I will now pass it over to Dr. Bilkowski. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kareem. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, from wherever you are uh, watching this webinar today. Uh, I appreciate the, the, uh, the time and the opportunity uh, for you to listen uh, in on what we like to um, talk about today. Um, before we uh, progress any, any further, just a, a couple of housekeeping uh, items. Um, the first is just a list of uh, the disclosures uh, for both myself and, and Dr. Gutterson that you can uh, read here uh, and review on your own. Uh, and then more importantly, with regards to the outline for the presentation today, uh, I will uh, uh, start with an overview uh, on a couple of uh, topics with regards to uh, emergency department or ED overcrowding and the, the concept of exit block. And then secondarily, with regards to the topic of boarding uh, in the emergency department. Uh, from there, Dr. Gunnison will take the middle section, uh, focusing on the lack of ED resources uh, and the impact of monitoring of vital signs within the emergency department. And then uh, transitioning over more into a discussion around uh, the use of continuous vital sign monitoring technology in the, in, in the emergency department and what type of uh, clinical evidence is uh, currently available or uh, potentially available in the future. Uh, and then uh, la the last section, uh, there will be a, uh, a dialogue between uh, Dr. Gunnarsson and myself going through three uh, use cases uh, to illustrate the opportunities of where continuous vital, vital side monitoring technology may be uh, applied. And then from there, uh, we will close out the, uh, the session with uh, a Q&A. &A. So uh, at this point, uh, if there are any questions uh, that uh, the audience wishes to, uh, to ask, please feel free to put those within the Q&A. Uh, section of this um, uh, of this platform. From there, let's uh, let's turn our attention to ED overcrowding. <clears throat> uh, the, the the tell the tell of this is um, that this is a, a problem that has not started just uh, two or three years ago. It's been present for for decades, uh, and the statistics show. Uh, show this in the in the United States between 2006 and 2014. There's been uh, an increase of ED visits by uh, over 18 percent. Uh, along with that, there has been an increase in just under seven percent of hospitalizations coming from the emergency department in the United States. And this is not just a, a U.S. centric problem. Uh, there is statistics coming from the United Kingdom that are highlighted here, where ED admissions have grown within the past 10, 15 years by approximately 50. 50, five, zero percent. Uh, but even more concerning uh, for the NHS uh, in the United Kingdom is that bed availability is going down. Uh, not a lot, but it's still going down. Um, and then there are uh, not published here uh, or presented here, but uh, Australia, New Zealand and other countries are also uh, demonstrating uh, and publishing issues around uh, overcrowding in their emergency department environments. And just just to put a, a footnote, the Institute of Medicine, that is a, a highly uh, regarded uh, med, uh, medical consortium of experts, uh, uh, penned this uh, this opinion back uh, in 2006 that uh, ED overcrowding is a public health uh, challenge. Uh, and why is that a challenge? It's because not only does it potentially affect patient care, but it also has st uh, stresses on uh, ED staff, of which we will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but just to add a, a little uh, added color to this is that um, critical care uh, staff shortages have been a problem that has been identified back in the early 2000s, where uh, several critical care societies uh, had uh, or penned a federal call to action to the U.S. government that that uh, uh, staff shortages will become a, uh, a crisis. That was 2004. We're now in 2024 and the problem is just getting worse. Uh, so there's clearly a tidal wave uh, with regards to the concerns around uh, crowding within the emergency department. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, the, the challenge from a staffing standpoint is with regards to staff well-being. Uh, Dr. Kellen penned, uh, penned, uh, penned this article um, a, a few years back, uh, flagging the the, uh, the analogy of the canary in the coal mine. Uh, uh, like I just said, that there's a tidal wave coming with regards to uh, staff well-being, ED overcrowding, and the like. Um, and you know, uh, public media uh, such as U.S. News has penned uh, penned an opinion on this as well. Uh, so this is not just uh, centric to the the medical literature. Uh, the uh, the broader uh, mainstream media is, is uh, caught on to this as well. Um, from there, 
let's uh, knowing that we have a problem with regards to uh, ED overcrowding, let's go into a couple of details with regards to uh, the components or the subcomponents thereof. The first one is is exit block. Uh, exit block, uh, the definition is here, but basically it is when a patient coming from the emergency department waiting for a bed in, uh, uh, in the hospital uh, inpatient or ICU is unable to get it because there's not enough resources available to be able to move that patient from, uh, from the emergency department into the quote unquote hospital. Uh, so the issues with regards to exit block, and we'll go into more details in, in the next couple of slides, is that there is uh, a delay in receiving ongoing patient care. Uh, there is a risk uh, for introducing negative patient outcomes. Uh, clearly, there is a, a patient uh, or customer satisfaction issue uh, that occur uh, uh, that occurs with this. And then uh, ultimately, uh, when you have exit block, you will have ED boarding, which we'll go into uh, a, little, a little bit more detail in subsequent slides. So uh, with regards to uh, exit block, uh, with uh, talking about some uh, uh, some of the challenges uh, <clears throat> or some of the uh, the variables that are contributing to this is that we already see that there's increased demand uh, that I presented a, a few slides ago. But now what you're also having is that there is an increased comorbidity associated with patients presenting into the emergency department. The graphic to the right is is, is a telltale. Uh, back in 2006, 2007, one out of every 10 patients that, that uh, came into the emergency department had five uh, or, or, or more co comorbid conditions uh, at the time of admission. In contrast, now that number is tripled. It's now one in three. Um, so what you're having is that you're having increased demand, you're having gr uh, greater complexity of patients that are coming into the hospital. And, and one of the things that's associated with that is uh, uh, is that the, pay, the demographics, both uh, in Canada, the United States, as well as in, in Europe, you're having an aging population. And with aging populations, you have increased number of comorbidities. There is a positive correlation between the two. And if you just look at the graphics here in Canada and, and in European Union, uh, the uh, the number of of uh, uh, individuals that are greater than 85 years uh, years uh, old will be doubling, if not tripling, uh, within the next uh, 30 to 40 years. So remember uh, that commentary from uh, Dr. K Kalin with regards to um, the canary in the coal mine. Well, now others have come out and says, "Hey, that, that canary is is lost. The canary has died." Uh, because the problem is becoming su uh, such critical uh, because it, it's affecting not only patient outcomes, but it's also uh, uh, staff well-being. Uh, so transitioning from exit block into ED boarding, and I said that they're, that they are relate, they're interrelated to, to one another. The definition here is somewhat similar, but a, a little bit more granular is that it is the practice of a patient that is, uh, been has been designated to be admitted uh, and waiting for an ED bed, uh, but the, uh, the time for them uh, waiting in the emergency department is becoming excessive. Typically, the thresholds for uh, ED admission um, uh, to define boarding is more than four hours. Uh, or uh, a more generous uh, uh, statistic or, or threshold would be waiting uh, overnight and not getting into a bed by, uh, by uh, noon the following day. Clearly, there is negative impacts with patients that are boarding. Um, it, just envision that a patient that is waiting for a hospital bed, they're in admitted status. The medical team is two, three, five, ten floors above from where the emergency department is uh, so uh, their routine means that after they round they have to come to the emergency department which is friction uh, so the medical team to come to the emergency department uh, become uh, becomes a constraint uh, that that affects uh, medical decision making the time to implement uh, admitting orders uh, or uh, continuing uh, con continuing care delivery um, and then the other thing is within the emergency department is that when boarding is present and when it worsens, there is data that shows that the triage decisions within the emergency department get skewed. And that skew is to be able to go and prioritize patients at a higher acuity level than they otherwise would have been uh, prioritized. So now you're having a, a, a self-feeding uh, uh, problem here where uh, it, it is putting additional strain on to seeing certain patients that maybe not as sick uh, as uh, as they would be during quote unquote quiet time, uh, but now they're being uh, stressed to be seen earlier within uh, within the in the emergency department. Uh, 
And all of this translates into negative patient outcomes. If you look at uh, ICU-centric uh, data of patients waiting for an ICU bed, uh, there's increased the risk of, associated with uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, increased uh, ICU lengths of stay as well as uh, ICU mortality, uh, but more broadly across the hospital population, the risk for uh, medication errors it, it is intuitive uh, that a patient um, that is being cared for on the uh, in the ED uh, for 12, 24 hours, um, there may be some logistical difficulties with regards to the uh, medical team that is up on, you know, 4-4 um, uh, coming down and uh, not transcribing the proper orders. And then clearly the, the bigger concerns, uh, more, more in the United States and less outside the United States, is with regards to some of these errors translating into mal medical malpractice suits. And then lastly, uh, no patient wants to be waiting in the hospital in the ED bed uh, for uh, 12, 24 hours while uh, they could have been admitted to the floor. So clearly there are, are a number of uh, variables uh, associated uh, with uh, exit block and ED boarding that are negative uh, in this outcome. Let's take just one one uh, article that looked at this. Uh, pretty interesting data. Singer uh, looked at this and looking at the impact of ED boarding, of waiting up to two hours versus up to twelve hours, or or at least twelve hours. And there is a statistical significantly diff, uh, different uh, outcome with when it comes to mortality as well as uh, hospital lengths of stay. Uh, a near doubling uh, of the uh, of the hospital mortality rate and an increase in three days of a patient that is boarding by 12 hours compared to two hours for the same level for the same kind of conditions uh, so clearly there are there are uh, uh, health uh, health as well as economic impact uh, uh, ramifications of ed boarding so uh, my section is uh, closing out and i just want to uh, uh, kind of uh, re-encapsulate what I was talking about. You're having negative negative demographic shifts, both with regards to uh, increased ED utilization, both in the United States and outside the United States. Uh, you're having uh, increased uh, comorbidities and complexity of patients being cared for. You're having additional stresses of the staff, the staff within the hospital as well as in the emergency department. Uh, it, that has been flagged by the Institutes of Medicine as well as uh, uh, inter, uh, national uh, critical care societies. Uh, so ultimately, there there is this convergence of all of these things that we're having to look for solutions, uh, whether they're large or small, to be able to help streamline uh, care and, and alleviate some of the uh, the burden that is uh, placed upon the workforce. And, and on that note, let me uh, transition over to Dr. Gunderson, who will carry uh, carry forward into the next section of our of our webinar. And I'll uh, talk to you soon. Thank you, Dr. Bilkowski, for that wonderful, uplifting, enlightening, uh, refreshing uh, review of. Uh, the state of the emergency department that, you know, uh, not only the United States, but all of the, the world seems to be experiencing at this time. Uh, that's a, a, a very uh, somber but uh, important background uh, to kind of take this to the next level where we can actually, I'm going to go over uh, some strategies about how maybe we can mitigate uh, this impact of boarding and, and patient crowding within the uh, ED. So when you first think about the crowding uh, and the, the increase in patient volume within the ED, uh, it's really overloading a system and pushing it to its breaking point. And there's all kinds of downstream effects that this has on our patient care, uh, these patients in the time of need. Uh, just by increasing uh, the number of patients coming in, we see times increasing for time to triage assessment by the nurses and then getting those patients into a proper room to be you know, taken care of, and then time to be seen by a provider or a physician, and then time to make up the decision of what the disposition is. Are we going to admit the patient or are we gonna send the patient home? And then there's another delay in getting that patient uh, to their proper uh, bed upstairs within the hospital. Uh, all of this really kind of starts off with in the first contact with our patients in triage. Uh, during this time, with these uh, increased pressures on our nurses up front in the triage area, the efficiency and decision-making process is definitely strained. 
uh, frequency of vital sign monitoring and uh, you know, just managing these patients with multiple reassessments really can be, you know, pushing uh, our our staff to the limit. And then you combine that with increased burnout uh, from our providers, increased turnover. Uh, so, you know, where we're uh, constantly having to train uh, ED nurses appropriately. And then also with uh, um managing patients that the ED really is just not set up to manage for long periods of time. Patients with multiple medications, patients with uh, nuanced specialty care, uh, patients with road trips, et cetera. This really is the tip of the sword or the tip of the spear that's going into some more problems within managing our patients within the ED. Before we really go into how we're getting our patients back to the various places, I'm just gonna go over one way of uh, the majority of the emergency departments in the ED uh, uses to uh, grade the uh, severity of illness uh, in triage. And for this, most common uh, scoring system is the Emergency Severity Index or ESI. Uh, it's on its uh, fourth iteration. It's a, a very uh, validated uh, algorithm uh, that's been published uh, in multiple uh, journals and uh, nurses that are trained on this, uh, it's very reproducible. And basically it's broken into five levels. The two levels on the extreme, level one and level five. Level one, uh, these are our patients who are extremely ill. They have life-threatening emergencies and they need a life-threatening uh, intervention. Uh, level five are the patients who really uh, have no a resource uh, need to, to get their definitive care. Uh, and just as a note, you can see down there in the bottom left, some examples of when I talk about resources, these are things like EKGs, labs, x-rays, et cetera. Um, level three is right in the middle. Now level three can be a little tricky because it's uh, patients who are undifferentiated they can easily go to a level four, which is less severe, or they can get down to level two or level one, which is even more severe. So level three are patients who are ill. Uh, however, their vital signs when initially taken are reassuring to some degree and definitely not in the danger zone. So when we talk about our ESI scores, there's a large number of patients that fall into our level three. And as you can imagine, uh, these patients are at increased risk during times of crowding uh, because the, um, uh, the time of uh, or the amount of reassessment is definitely decreased and the amount of tension that's paid on these patients is definitely decreased. Now, there have been several attempts to try and mitigate this uh, influx of patients to try and get them to definitive care sooner. One of them uh, this was actually started uh, or actually took favor during the COVID pandemic was putting a provider or a physician out in triage. Now, this was uh, a, a paper that was uh, written up by a California emergency department, a large 83,000 patients a year uh, community uh, hospital. Uh, this model, as you can see on the left, it's where the patients come in there's a central area to where the nurses do a rapid scoring system, uh, rapid assessment. And if the patients need uh, immediate care, they get sent to the appropriate uh, resuscitation bay, the trauma bay, or the psychiatric uh, unit. However, if the patients are less sick, then a physician can see the patient, do a quick examination, and then make a determination of where these patients need to go. Either they, they can be upgraded to, to an acute care zone or they can go down to a mid-level uh, type of uh, care facility uh, within the ED or even to a fast track portion of the emergency department. Now, this actually looks good on paper and uh, you know managing patients with this can actually be very efficient. It has been shown that it does increase several operational ED functions such as decreased door to provider time, decreased length of stay of discharged patients, and then a decrease of patients who are leaving without completion of their services. So 
in times of where the system is not stressed, this triage position and triage model actually works well. However, as what Dr. Bilkowski was pointing out, when we have increased boarding or increased patients taking up the ED beds, this whole system gets clogged up. Um, the model still improves the door to physician or door to provider time, and it also improves the uh, length of stay for the discharge patients. However, for those sicker patients that need to be admitted uh, and are waiting for beds upstairs, it really does nothing to uh, affect that time, and it does nothing to affect uh, mortality or length of hospital stay. So it. It looks good, and in theory, it, it, it works, but however, like anything else, when the system is stressed, uh, this loses its efficiency and is just not the, the answer to the problem. So we talked about triage, and the next step after triage, uh, chronologically, would be moving to the patient's room within the ED. However, when the boarding is very high and we have a problem with that, there's actually no place to put the patients. And so we're in this no man zone or this abyss or this black hole that occurs after the patients are triaged and they're waiting for a bed in the ED. You know, these patients are usually pushed back into the emergency, or I'm sorry, into the waiting room, or there may be some post triage area on stretchers in a side part of the emergency department. The problem with this is these areas are not staffed well. Uh, ideally, uh, we try and staff one to 10 from a nursing to patient ratio, uh, and that's not nearly a one to four, one to five, or even one to three ratio we see in our normal ED area. Uh, the, the reassessment of vital signs is infrequent. Uh, sometimes it's not even uh, reassessed. Uh, and the deterioration in this area is unmonitored, and so deterioration uh, many times can go undetected. So we talked about the frequency of vital sign monitoring, especially in that, uh, that no man's land or in that uh, black hole zone between being triaged and moving back into the uh, regular emergency department treatment area. It's extremely important. Uh, nurses reassessment of our patients is essential to their care, especially for those ESI uh, uh, three, those mid-range patients who are at risk. Uh, again, usually good staffing is around one nurse to 10 uh, uh, patients, but frequently in rush times, we'll see one nurse to 20 or even one nurse to 30 patients. And so you can imagine uh, the, the amount of reassessment that's being done is markedly decreased. The other thing that's uh, important uh, about this is there's really no guideline, especially in the emergency department in the, uh, in the United States, of how frequently these vital signs need to be uh, reassessed. Even based on uh, ESI score, there are some uh, hospital-driven uh, policies or protocols, but again, these are very uh, independent of each individual health system, and there's no guidance overall. And when Actually, uh, several investigators have looked at how good are we at reassessing our patients that are in this uh, gray zone or in this danger zone. We really do a, a, a dismal job of doing this to where uh, adherence to vital sign collection, we a lot of times aren't even uh, checking vital signs again uh, up until six hours or so after initial triage. And even if they are, some of the most important ones such as the pulse oximetry or respiratory rate uh, is missing in up to 30 or to 40 percent of our patients. Now, is there any evidence that collecting these vital signs more frequently, or even ideally, if it's continuous, has uh, improved outcome of our patients, or is even potentially beneficial for our patients? Uh, I'm going to go over a few uh, uh, studies here. Uh, needless to say. There has not been a lot of data or a lot of literature addressing this, uh, and these have all been relatively uh, recent, and is, this is a ripe area for research, uh, especially in nowadays when we're having uh, more constraints on uh, staffing within the ED. So one study uh, that was published uh, back in uh, 2014, one of the older studies was uh, uh, a Danish study 
showed that around 30% of patients on triage when they had normal vital signs well then ultimately admitted there was up to 30 percent of those patients actually had clinical deterioration that those initial triage vital signs did not detect now if you look over in the graph on the right you'll see it's kind of hard to tell but the the, the two dotted lines right here reflect both of the respiratory uh, uh, parameters, the pulse oximetry and the respiratory rate. Those changed very early uh, compared to the other vital signs uh, in, the, in the patients over that ensuing 24 hours to where potentially uh, these patients could have been identified even up to four hours after uh, the initial vital signs were taken uh, of somebody that might be at risk for uh, decompensating. So this is one study that shows just the normal vital signs in triage is not enough that we need to check these. Uh, what is the appropriate interval? That's hard to say. However, uh, vital signs such as respiratory rate and pulse oximetry are very, very important at subtly detecting deterioration of these patients. And unfortunately, these are two uh, vital sign parameters that are not frequently repeated when the reassessment is done. Now, uh, another uh, study that was uh, published um, back in uh, 23 showed that in a community hospital, uh, there was a higher incidence of ICU transfers within the first 24 hours. Uh, now, of these ICU transfers, the patients with, again, shortness of breath, hypoxemia, were overly represented as compared to the other vital signs. Uh, so looking at the respiratory system, again, over 50% of patients that deteriorated had abnormal respiratory system vital signs, either by shortness of breath, dyspnea, hypoxia, feeling of, uh, of air hunger. Uh, when used in an early warning system, the respiratory rate was the most predictive value of all of the vital signs. Again, so one of the most infrequently checked and rechecked vital signs is arguably one of the most important vital signs to monitor uh, for early deterioration of our, uh, of our higher risk patients. Now, is there any data about continuous vital signs? Again, there's a paucity of evidence in, in this degree. However, there's a couple papers that uh, kind of uh, tend to address this issue in a, in, a, in, a, in a logical way. So when we think about uh, the clinical deterioration in the ED, this really can happen in the, in the danger zone of the two phases of care that were mentioned before. That, that zone after triage and before being seen by a provider uh, and, and you know, uh, getting back into the, uh, the main emergency department. This can be mitigated to some degree by having a physician up in triage, but for the most part, these patients can wait six, seven, eight hours after being triaged to make it back to a bed to where they can start getting their definitive emergency department care. And then the other danger time is once the patient's been admitted to an inpatient service and they're waiting for the bed. And this is again, what Dr. Bilkoski talked about, this is our border patients. These are two very danger zones that our patients are, are really high risk uh, decompensating. Again, to date, there's limited evidence to support this. Uh, there are some limitations about how to go about this, such as cost of the equipment, the equipment gets lost, it's broken, you know, walks away, uh, who are we going to monitor, where are we going to do it, etc. But there are a couple examples that I'll bring your attention to. So the first study uh, was used for uh, patients, this is a pediatric population, uh, with a, a wearable vital sign technology for uh, febrile kids in the ED to predict progression to sepsis. Uh, and as you know, you know, sepsis is on a continuum and a lot of these kids are at risk when they come in, but they don't quite fit the criteria. So these patients were placed on uh, uh, continuous monitoring technology and the, the algorithm used really focused on the heart rate and the respiratory rate. So the least the respiratory rate was has been shown before an extremely important parameter to detect uh, early deterioration 
and very uh, interesting, which uh, it kind of you know fits the proof of concept, is that the model was actually able to predict uh, sepsis early, uh, roughly nine hours compared to when the manually or when the routine vital signs were collected. So the continuous vital signs were actually very good at picking up patients who would then click over on the surge criteria to would trigger then a, a, a sepsis team or a, a change in care uh, response, uh, more so than just uh, relying on manual reassessment of our, uh, of our vulnerable patients. And then the second one uh, was uh, done at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, this was uh, published uh, back in 21 where again, wearable vital sign technology uh, monitors were used for patients on the general medicine floor. And these were trying to predict patients who are gonna deteriorate and see if rapid response teams were uh, affected by having early continuous vital signs rather than say your vital signs check every shift, every eight hours, et cetera. They did find out that after having this technology on, the rapid response team activation decreased by over 50%. Uh, and actually those patients who were sick enough and the vital sign technology picked up their decompensation, those were then transferred uh, to the ICU, but their length of stay in the ICU decreased by almost a day. Now that could be argued that we were able to catch our patients earlier in their disease process and thus we're able to start addressing them sooner before they really got sick. Uh, the other interesting thing about this, as you can imagine, the nurses really love this technology because this continuous level is, is providing a set of monitoring and vital signs that they are just not able to uh, re replicate even in the best of circumstances. Now, what are some potential cases? How can we use this uh, technology uh, within the emergency department? We're gonna, you know, Dr. Bolkowski and I, we're gonna move over into uh, a next couple of uh, clinical scenarios that we see, and not too infrequently, I see this probably, you know, at least once or twice a, a shift uh, while I'm the physician in triage, uh, and I don't have the luxury of having a continuous technology. So the first case we'll bring up here, this again is a very common uh, patient presentation. A 65 year old female, female that presents to the ED with cough, with fevers and chills and sweats for two days. Uh, she has a history of diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, colon cancer, uh, status post surgery and is currently in remission. Prior to arriving to the ED, she took uh, acetaminophen and ibuprofen. And on the triage assessment, her temperature was 37.8 degrees centigrade, had a heart rate of 105, respiratory rate of 20, blood pressure of 103 over 45, and her pulse oximetry was 92% on room air. When you listen to her, her lungs, she had a few wheezes and she was diaphoretic or sweaty. Now, when we look at this, she does have one out of four SERS criteria and we're assuming that this is being driven by an infection. So she has possible sepsis. Um, the orders that were done were ordering some blood, some routine blood work and get a chest X-ray and she needed an IV and we're gonna give some IV fluid and possible IV antibiotics. So as far as the ESI triage score, she had about three resources used. She had no vital signs that were in the danger zone. So this patient would have been uh, an ESI level of three. Now, keep in mind at this time, the ED is extremely busy and an ESI of three is going to get you moved to another area in the waiting room or an area uh, not in the actual treatment area for the ED. So how is that gonna pan out? Well, what happens with this patient? She goes back to the waiting area, vital signs aren't in danger zone, but using several resources with the laboratory, et cetera, and our nurses are understaffed, so they're not able to reassess her as much as they would like. What if we, is this a patient that we could place a continuous monitor on, you know, monitor for progression of sepsis? We could monitor respiratory rate change. We could monitor pulse oximetry change or change in her saturation. Remember, these are the two, 
two of the most important uh, part of early decompensation detection in our sick patients. And of course, we can you know monitor a change in our heart rate too. So the patient waits for at least four hours until the next assessment. Now her respiratory rate is up to 28. Her saturation is down to 84%. She's now markedly hypoxic and her heart rate has increased to 125. So this prompts uh, the nurse or the uh, physician provider to be activated. He activates the sepsis pathway uh, and starts treating uh, the sepsis uh, four hours after uh, the patient presented to the emergency department. And the question is, if the, she was on the continuous monitor, could this possibly have been detected earlier? My, uh, my opinion would be yes. And we could have started a definitive sepsis treatment, getting the antibiotics earlier, getting the IV fluids earlier, uh, and getting the, you know, the care of this patient earlier, and even moving the patient back to a higher level of care earlier than what the current model with the uh, uh, routine manual vital signs provided. So this is just one example, and I will turn it over to Dr. Bulkowski to uh, take on the next couple of uh, sample examples. Very good. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Gunnarsson. And you know, just just one comment with uh, to Dr. Gunnarsson's uh, uh, case just a second ago. Uh, we we've been trained that time to treat is important. Uh, if you look at uh, trauma, you, you talk about the goal an hour. Uh, if you look at car, uh, acute cardiac uh, events, uh, you know, door to uh, door to uh, drug time, door to needle time uh, are important. So the earlier you can recognize uh, issues. Um, the earlier you can start implementing therapy. Uh, the same thing is here is that the premise and triage is that the patient has a spot has a spot check in time, uh, and then the patient may declare themselves. Uh, and with having uh, a, a spot check vital signs, you may not be able to capture that that uh, quote unquote declaration uh, of the patient until that that spot check occurs that could be two or four hours later. Um, and, and the issue really is uh, that uh, patients that are in, um, uh, that are triaged in that ESI three, that's kind of the bell-shaped curve. That is where the large majority of patients fall in. That's kind of the, the abyss. Um, from my standpoint, um, that is an opportunity zone uh, to, to solve on the front end or a uh, one of the bookends is on triage. The second one, I don't have a, a, a case, uh, but more of a, of a narration around the use case for AD boarding. There are, there are studies that have shown that patients that have, uh, as Dr. Gunnarsson talked about, uh, rapid response team notifications after they got admitted within the first 24 hours, there are certain patient populations that benefit, that, that could have the potential to benefit from this type of continuous vital sign monitoring. Uh, clearly those that have pulmonary issues, acute febrile illness uh, admissions uh, makes, uh, makes a fair amount of sense. And you know, the interesting thing is the paradigm here is that a patient that is being admitted to the ICU, they're being monitored. So that's, that's outside of the scope of this, but there's, a, there's a, a cadre of patients that are being admitted to telemetry where they have continuous uh, 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 cardiac or electrocardiographic monitoring, but they don't have respiratory rate monitoring. They do not have uh, SpO2 monitoring. There's plenty of literature talking about the overutilization of telemetry. That is a that is a quote unquote a safety net or a halo around the patient. But there is an opportunity where pa patients that are having uh, uh, a, a cardi cardiovascular decompensation, maybe it's congestive heart failure, not a, a acute coronary syndrome, where you can also apply a continuous vital sign monitoring on patients that are now in a boarding state. Clearly, if a patient that has uh, been identified to get admitted, they're going to the floor, beds are, beds are plenty, um, the technology is not necessarily uh, applicable, but most mer most emergency departments are uh, on a week in week out basis are going to be under stress, and boarding is going to become uh, present or prevalent at some point during the day. My days when when Dr. Gunderson and I uh, worked and trained at Henry Ford, uh, every Monday was not a good day. <laughs> We're always busy, so guarantee that Monday is going to be a day where you're boarding patients. Why? 
it just it maybe it was a Detroit thing. But uh, that is just uh, one one caveat where um, patients that are waiting for a bed in, in a boarding status, certainly those that have dyspnea, some cardiovascular concerns, acute febrile illness. I would even expand it to things that, that tend to be a little bit more cryptogenic and they need to declare further. Undifferentiated abdominal pain, uh, as an example, and then uh, those with altered mentation, uh, not necessarily due to uh, psych, uh, psychogenic issues or from uh, drug toxicity issues, but uh, the, the patient that comes in with uh, undifferentiated ultra mental status, they're not going to be verbal. So uh, having the uh, the safety that, of continuous vital signs um, in that uh, in that patient that has already been declared to be boarding would be beneficial. Uh, Dr. Gunner, said anything that you'd want to care uh, to, to add here uh, before I move on to the, the third and final case? No, that's 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 very good. You know, uh, just like you said, we have a false sense of security with watching telemetry patients when, in fact, uh, respiratory rate, you know, hypoxia is is probably a lot more predictive of somebody who's going downhill and decompensating, uh, and that happens before you see any type of change in your, you know, in your, uh, you know, your in your rest in your uh, heart rate or even heart rhythm for that matter. So. Uh, I, I totally agree with what you said. Very good, great, thanks. And let's uh, let, let, let's uh, wind down this uh, this webinar onto a final use case. Um, you know, we, we talked about the the bookends. You look at early on in the emergency department triage. We're looking at the back end. We talked about boarding, uh, so looking at a certain uh, cadre of patients that may benefit uh, from having continuous vital sign monitoring during uh, uh, while they're waiting for a bed. Um, but then the other place is in the middle. Uh, we see patients in the emergency department. Uh, we are uh, I implementing a diagnostic uh, and therapeutic care plan, and we're we're allowing time to be a, a benefit to us because time uh, time helps uh, the patient to declare themselves whether or not they are getting better or uh, or they're deteriorating. Just as Dr. Gunnarsson was talking about the sepsi septic patient in triage, the same thing happens in uh, while after they've already been. Uh, 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 seen by a physician and the care plan is being implemented. The places where I, uh, in my opinion, where, where there would be benefit is in patients that have acute febrile illnesses. So someone comes in with a pneumonia, someone comes in with a cough, someone comes in with uh, uh, a suspected cellulitis or a deep space abscess. Uh, that's an area where you'd like to be able to monitor that respiratory rate continuously. That's also a, a place where you want to monitor their, their pulse and heart rate continuously. Um, and clearly those that have dyspnea or pulmonary symptoms, the, the continuous SpO2 uh, would, be of, uh, would be of value. And, and the benefit of uh, utilizing this during their care plan is to help further refine the ability that the patient is actually on a course of improvement or a course of deterioration to further codify your decision that the patient needs to stay longer. Maybe I need to put them in an observation uh, status uh, in, in my ED, uh, or they declare themselves so that they actually warrant being uh, admitted to the hospital. And, and it really, it's the, the, the challenge is those, those ESI threes, that's the bulk of the patients they are seen in the non-monitored part of the emergency department. And when it's busy, those that nursing nursing the patient ratios balloon. So how do you provide some benefit or some 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 uh, some support to the nursing staff uh, that just can't get the vital signs done uh, uh, on uh, on a frequent basis? While they also have to help support the implementation of care. Uh, so I think that's another area that that is uh, ripe for talking. And if I can, it, it, it's an interesting uh, tangent. Uh, the we talk about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. AI is pre prevalent all around uh, uh, the world as, as we talk. Um, not as much coming out in, in, in healthcare, but there is a place where machine learning can really shine. And machine learning will shine as you have greater data, especially continual data flows. That is a, that's an opportunity where I think that, that in the next you know two to 10 years, there's gonna be a transformation by being able to take more continuous uh, uh, patient-centric variables, uh, labs, vital signs, electrocardiographic information, et cetera, um, and then be able to assimilate that into a machine learning algorithm to help further uh, support these decision-making processes of sick, not sick, improving, not improving. Um, 
so uh, Dr. Gunnarsson, anything to add on, on this before we uh, transition into the closing? No, you're absolutely right. We've actually had several grants here looking at that uh, machine learning to, and actually looking at waveform uh, outside of the normal squiggly lines that we have been accustomed to, you know, detecting for such as ECG or EKG tracings, looking at the waveforms in between it, uh, using machine learning has actually been able to predict patients several uh, hours sometimes before they have their decompensation. So you hit the nail right on the head. AI is really going to help us uh, monitor our patients in a very uh, a more strategic and early and in a way where we can act earlier on them than currently are. Wonderful. Thank, thanks for that. So let me uh, let me uh, uh, cl close this out, and we can transition over to a Q and A. Uh, have about ten minutes left. So uh, as I started off, there was this, uh, uh, an objective that we wanted to talk about: ED overcrowding, ED uh, uh, ED boarding, uh, the negative implications associated with that. Clearly, there are patient challenges associated with that, with uh, adverse outcomes, but there are staff challenges associated with that uh, as well. Um, Looking at the the implementation of vital signs in, in the in the emergency department, uh, there's no set schedule, uh, but they are uh, routinely monitored. Continuous vital sign monitoring is an opportunity to help uh, augment uh, the clinical team uh, to be able to uh, improve their workflow is one. Uh, maybe alleviate some of their burden, that's a second. But then ultimately it's uh, helping to drive uh, patient care decisions to see uh, where, are, where are they in their clinical course. Um, so uh, some of the obvious places where uh, it can show some benefit uh, is with regards to uh, undifferentiated respiratory complaints, uh, undifferentiated acute febrile illness uh, is, is, is another uh, another example, uh, and then ultimately what we what we're calling for here is that this is not the the panacea that you need to implement this uh, at, at present time, but it is certainly a call that the, there's enough uh, body of evidence and scientific basis that this technology has uh, has merit. Start start uh, implementing, start uh, conducting research and identifying where this type of technology will shine and where, where it may actually not be able to provide the necessary benefits. As, as Dr. Gunderson uh, talked about the physician and triage model, it certainly works when the, the hospital is not stressed, but what happens uh, when you're at DEF CON 5 and, and uh, patients are waiting 12 to 24 hours to be seen? Uh, so on that note, I'll close out uh, the, uh, the presentation and I will transition this back to Kareem. Uh, for a Q&A session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Bilkowski and Dr. Gunnarsson for those insights. So we'll now address questions from the audience. Um, at this time, we're only able to address questions in English, and please bear in mind that some questions and responses may not be relevant in all countries. The first question uh, will be directed to you, Dr. Bilkowski, as it was um, related to the first part of the presentation on ED block and ED boarding. And the question is, are ED virtual observation units um, a solution to this problem? Uh, so, so just to encapsulate uh, the, the question, so looking at virtual, uh, the, the ability to, for virtual monitoring, absolutely, uh, there are capabilities to be able to provide virtual solutions uh, within the hospital environment. Just as an example, uh, there, there are telehealth uh, systems that are being implemented to, to solve the issue with uh, critical care coverage uh, in rural hospitals in the United States. Uh, so clearly there is there is that capability. However, I, I will just throw a little bit of caution is with regards to the, the implementation uh, of, of that type of a solution is by being able to build the infrastructure of not only the technology uh, at the hospital, the bridge, uh, to be able to, uh, to to virtualize that that information, and then being able to have some type of a care team uh, that has the ability to watch, and then to be able to safeguard and communicate back uh, to 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 the local facility. Typically, virtual care uh, platforms work when you can operate at scale. Um, it, uh, you need to have uh, a, a more, more likely a, a delivery network of of several hospitals where that. Uh, that would be uh, optimally uh, utilized because uh, you will be able to gain efficiencies by having uh, one or two providers being able to monitor uh, three or four hospitals where patients are in a boarding status, as, as an example. Uh, 
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Bilkowski. The next question is um, related to metrics. So are there specific metrics that demonstrate an ED is running or being managed at its best? Yeah, I'll take that. That's a, that's a very good question. So there are two basic types of metrics. One is we consider our operational metrics, and those are just basically how good is the ED at moving our patients through. So this is really based on time. So how quickly can the patient you know, be triaged and be seen by a, a provider, a physician? How quickly is it from when the physician sees the patient does the first tests get ordered or the or the uh, or the uh, uh, x-rays get done and then it's how quickly can the patient uh, can the decision be made where the patient can either be discharged home or admitted and then the other time is how fast are they uh, moved from the emergency department to their inpatient bed if they are admitted so all of these time metrics kind of help with operational flow based on hospital crowding can help with staffing, especially in surge time. However, <laughs> this is a really good question. If you really want to nail it down to how well that ED is working, you look at disease specific metrics and in, you know, there are several of them. It's like, how quickly can we uh, uh, diagnose someone with a ST segment elevation MI? And when we diagnose them, how quickly then can they go to the cath lab to get their, you know, to get their coronary arteries open? somebody presents with a stroke, how quickly can we do the CAT scan, get neurology down, or do that NIH stroke scale ourselves to end up uh, getting uh, the patient referred to neurointerventional uh, or by giving uh, thrombolytics you know, by the ED physician. And then of course the big one is sepsis. How early can we detect sepsis with their vital signs? How quickly can they get fluid? How quickly can uh, patients get uh, antibiotics? Uh, and how quickly can we uh, get blood cultures and repeat lactate to, uh, to kind of gauge our resuscitation. So all of these disease specific metrics, if the ED is hitting on them, but not doing well with the operational metrics, I would argue that that ED has actually found a way to, to optimize patient care in these really uh, uh, trying times of, of uh, overload and, and patient crowding. That's a good question. Hey, uh, Kareem, uh, if I can just add add to that, uh, you know, I appreciate metrics uh, and I work in the industry, so KPIs are, are prevalent for all the companies that I, I touch and interact with. Um, at the, the emerging department is no, no different. However, I think you, you, one has to appreciate that this is this is a just a uh, just one element of the bigger uh, facility of operations at the hospital level. Uh, so there also needs to be a look at operate uh, of uh, of uh, optimizing the uh, the metrics at the hospital level, the throughputs for these different disease states, the ability of a patient to be cleared, uh, you know, while waiting for a be uh, to be discharged, why uh, being able to clear them out in the morning, maybe in the holding area, so that that patient that is waiting in the emergency department doesn't have to wait until after twelve o'clock for the patient uh, that's that's in the bed uh, to be cleared. Uh, you know, take take a take a look at Airbnb. Uh, you have to check out at eleven. Uh, if you don't, you get you get penalized. Something along those same lines. Uh, it would be a refreshing look to look um, more system wise at, at, at the hospital uh, more broadly. All right. Well, thank you. Um, another question is: Is there a patient criteria or area in the ED you would use to put an ED patient on continuous monitoring? Or should all patients who enter the ED have some type some type of continuous monitoring? You know, let me let me take that first, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Gunnison to, to add some uh, some color. Uh, to to me, my 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 opinion is uh, with new technology, the best way to to approach is is to uh, put your foot in the water first, as opposed to as opposed to jumping in, uh, and and then demonstrate the proof, and then start to expand. Uh, identify areas where additional uh, disease states or, or symptom complexes could be beneficial. So to me, the obvious ones are acute febrile illness. Why? You look at the, the Korean study uh, for, for sepsis prediction, uh, that, that has the ability to identify uh, patients that de declare with, uh, with sepsis earlier and time to treat sepsis uh, is, is a continuum, so uh, you can be able to reverse that cascade. Acute pulmonary uh, illness is, is the other one. Uh, for me, that, that, that's an obvious place to start. 
Um, and then the other the, the other places uh, for triage, uh, ESI. Uh, if you have an ESI three, that there's a there's a wide range of patients that are in ESI three, and to be able to go and do a demonstration over the course of say three or six months, apply apply this technology to ESI threes and identify what patient population or what cohort are are being able to identify some some actionable signal that gives you the opportunity to say I, I i applied this broadly to an esi3 or i can cater my my triage continuous vital sign uh, monitoring implementation to an esi3 with a b and c uh features and that's where that's where that's where machine learning will come into into play with this and and learning your 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 patient centric data and what happens in one hospital may not be the same uh at some place uh, across the country or in europe uh, or uh, or elsewhere. Dr. Gunderson, anything you'd like to add? You know, I definitely would agree, you know, depending on your resources, uh, strategically, uh, ESI-3 patients, and then, of course, all ESI-2 and ESI-1, uh, ideally all ESI-3, and this, of course, there's some outliers, and it's, you know, the patients aren't at risk. So uh, the vast majority of ESI-3 and above from a severity standpoint. All right. Um, then the next question is, would it be better to have more hospital personnel or rely on technology instead? I'll take that. I'll take that first. That, that is a double-edged sword um, uh, because uh, I, uh, I, I've been involved in uh, talking ab uh, about adaptable acuity, so uh, uh, flex capacity models uh, in, the, in the hospital and ICU uh, uh, previously. The challenge is with re with resources. You can always go and, and staff up resources. Uh, the problem is what happens if you don't have the demand? Uh, so it's always matching supply and demand to, to allow the hospitals to operate uh, as efficient as efficiently as possible. There, there's certainly the ability to benchmark your your uh, your patient volumes uh, throughout the week, uh, so that you can actually have flex staffing to accommodate that. But it, that only goes so far. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to predict. Uh, with, with great uh, great precision, the demand uh, for services on any given day or any given hour. Um, so if you get overwhelmed, uh, the bus comes in, quote unquote, as we 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 uh, colloquial have called this many a times. What are you going to do? You just have to plug plug through and 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 manage them as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And that's where I think technology uh, like this, the continuous vital sign monitoring, helps helps to alleviate those concerns. Yeah, I would just take this, you know, a little bit more direct. If looking at it from a business standpoint, from a hospital, technology is cheap in the long run. You can depreciate it over time, uh, and it can actually, you know, uh, come off your books uh, over several years. Whereas hospital personnel are very expensive. They have salaries, they have training, they have onboarding, they have benefits. Uh, so definitely, from a business standpoint, uh, the personnel is the most expensive part of your business. Now, that being said, from a care standpoint, I think good technology used appropriately in the hands of a well-trained uh, clinician uh, is is actually uh, fantastic and it's irreplaceable. And so I would you know say that you can have both and you can actually decrease the amount of personnel uh, if you have good technology that's actually able to do what it's built to do, it's been proven, and you have uh, personnel that know how to use it and you have systems put into place to optimize that care. That is so well stated. Absolutely. All right, and we have a lot of incoming questions, so I'll try to combine a couple of them, and I think after that we'll take one last question. Um, so have you used um, some of those continuous monitoring technologies in your ED virtual observation units or ED halls, and then what's keeping ED departments around the world from using similar technologies in their EDs already today? Yeah, at the, at, in the University of Michigan, we actually uh, are in the process of uh, making various different types of you know, triage assessments of you know, scoring systems for critical illness. We have them running in the background. We have uh, EPIC as our, as our uh, electronic record that's hooked up with our uh, it's hooked up with our monitoring systems. And so we can cue the vital signs every uh, few seconds, actually, and we can have a scoring system flash on the board. 
And that's just something homegrown, so to speak, within the Epic platform. We have used other ones. I think I see the, the you know, the, the question was on there, one of them was Fifth Eye. Uh, we've actually helped develop some technology with Fifth Eye, so we do have some experience with that. Uh, again, we're trying to find the best fit for our workflow and our patient's needs. And we're just constantly expanding and trying it on. And that's what I would recommend. It's hard to find what you need, just basically what's off the shelf. And at Michigan, we've been kind of fortunate that we've been able to kind of develop some of these for our own, our own personal needs. And if you have the resources, you may find that that's, you know, something that health system can do too. Uh, if not, there are some really good ones out there that can just give you the, the bare bones basics that, that definitely uh, will identify patients at risk. So uh, a little combination of both there. I think the limitation of using it um, uh, basically is a lot of these systems are expensive, expensive to purchase that technology. And then, you know, just the support system it has, you need, you know, specific IT personnel that knows how to get in behind and troubleshoot when something's not working. You know, some of them are hardwired. You have to uh, other technology that goes into that. And, you know, and they, and then the obs you know, obsolescence of them, is this good for five years and something else comes down the, down the road. And if it's within the same platform, that's great. But if it's, if you're switching platforms out every five years, then, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, question the uh, utility of some technology based on that. Yeah, and Dr. Gunnarsson, if I can just add add to that uh, a little bit more holistically, because I, I'm more involved on getting uh, products cleared through the FDA or regulatory bodies around the world. I've, I've probably cleared uh, or helped companies clear at least 50, if not 70 of them uh, in the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And, and you know, the, the burden always is with implementation is uh, what's the unmet need? What's the clinical benefit? Obviously, those are those are the ones that 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 start off, but there also has to be the, this motivation to change. Um, uh, and then what's the what what's the, the cost benefit of change? Uh, how do you go and motivate change? Um, so to be able to implement continuous vital sign monitoring is uh, is it follows that that similar rubric. Uh, and I'll just give a, a, a quick uh, 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 analogy um, for you know uh, robotic surgery. Uh, robotic surgery has transformed uh, sur uh, surgical care. However, there's a steep learning curve for surgeons to understand how to use a robot. Um, but the fidelity and the resolution of it became obvious to the, to the surgeons that they were willing to go and, and, and invest the time to change their practice so that they can implement surgical robotics into, into uh, their ability to, uh, to provide surgical care. Uh, but it, it, and, and when we were talking about implementing technology that's expensive, that's incredibly expensive. Uh, these uh, these robotic surgery uh, systems are not a hundred thousand dollars to implement. They're uh, they're seven they're seven figures in the United States and elsewhere. But they they've done a, a very good job of penetrating uh, globally uh, for uh, broad swaths of surgical care. So that's just an example. And that's a good segue, Dr. Bilkowski, into the last question uh, related also to um, change management and implementation. So could you talk through some key strategies for, success, for successful implementation of continuous monitoring technology in DED? You want to take that, Kyle, start and I'll finish? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just you know, uh, do it first. Well, a couple things, Dr. Bilkowski was very good at, at saying you have to identify what's the problem, what's, what are we trying to fix? And then when you can, and that's sometimes that's the hardest question. And so if you can narrow it down to say, what exactly are we trying to fix here? What are we trying to address? What is the, what is the a core issue with our current state of, you know, a, a, of caring for patients? And when you can identify that, then you can identify ways to help mitigate that or, or, or bring in, you know, if it's technology, if it's protocols, if it's care plans, et cetera, or if it's hiring more nurses or, or whatever it is, then you can start working on that. But what's key to this is that you have to find a champion. And it's not going to work if you don't have a nurse champion and a physician champion. You have to have a dyad. And dyads are very, very, very powerful. They're put in position by senior leadership within the, the you know, the health system or the, the, the departments, in this case, the emergency department. And so they trust this dyad of physician and nurse to 
do the research, talk to the people to vet it, you know, to try it out and to see really what works and continually do uh, uh, quality improvement to see how well it's being utilized and if it's actually making a difference uh, in caring for our patients. If you don't have those champions, it's never going to change. You're never going to have a, a change in your culture uh, wherever you're at. You have to have champions. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, uh, I, I'm going to be non-clinical in, in this regard. And, and I published uh, some work on this 20 years ago on motivation. So I'll, I'll, I'll reflect back on that. Um, change requires motivation, uh, ultimately. So these dyads, I, I totally agree with what Dr. Gunderson says. You need champions uh, and you need support within the institution um, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to fuel this. Uh, but then to be able to go and get broad, uh, broad uh, speaking uh, implementation of the teams, they have to also share in that motivation that not only is there a benefit to the patient, but there's a benefit to themselves. Uh, ultimately, we're, we as clinicians, you know, physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, et cetera, we're all there charged of taking care of the patient. Uh, but, at, but the flip side is that they want to be internally motivated that maybe their workflow is better uh, on the flip side, they, that, that, their work, that it's, it, it's a little simpler. I have a little less headache. Uh, maybe the information that I'm getting now, uh, I get better signal. I don't have to deal with the noise, right? Because what they want to do is they want to do value add work as opposed to dealing with uh, alerts uh, or, 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 uh, or distractions that take them away from, from actually uh, delivering patient care. So motivation is really important and understanding what are the, the, the motivation drivers of the team that will implement this are equally important and, and have to be nurtured. All right, so we are over time, and I'm sorry we could not answer all of the questions. We'll try and answer some of them offline. Um, and so now this webinar is coming to an end, so thank you for your time and attention. I'd also like to thank Dr. Bilkowski and Dr. Gunnarsson for their presentation. And as mentioned earlier, you'll be able to watch this webinar's recording along with past webinars on the Clinical View website at clinicalview.ghealthcare.com. In closing, we'd like to, we would appreciate your feedback. So we have a short survey that will pop up uh, at the end of this broadcast. It should not take more than two minutes. Thank you again and stay well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everybody.